Okay, welcome to the first of our in-depth looks at uh, the elements of criminal liability. And we're going to start in this video with the actus reus. If you remember, it forms one part of our equation. Actus reus plus mens rea plus the absence of a defence equals criminal liability. And we're going to look in depth now at what we mean by actus reus, or certainly in depth enough for the um, A-level syllabus. And if you remember, the first thing that we said is that actus reus is this sort of notion of a guilty act. And um, it covers, essentially, in definitional terms, the conduct of the accused. So it covers the conduct of the accused. And I don't want you to get that mixed up with this notion that we said in the last video about a conduct crime. This is talking about the behaviour, if you like, is a better word, of the accused. And um, what it essentially means is it can be an act of commission, i.e. doing something, or an act of omission, not doing something. And it must also be a voluntary act that causes the damage or harm. And we'll look at each of those in the course of um, this short video. So, what do we mean then in terms of commission or omission? Well, in short, a person can, in terms of the commission, do something that the law prohibits. So let's just write that down. Do something that law prohibits. And by that, I mean when the law says you can't do something and you go and do it, that's the commission. I know that I'm not allowed to kill anybody because that would be murder. So me killing somebody means that I am doing something that the law prohibits. But there are some occasions in which you can be, you can complete the actus reus by doing or not doing something that the law requires. So that's not doing something not doing something that law requires. And I've put this picture here to demonstrate this. This is a, a roadside breath test. And the law requires you to provide a sample of breath to a police officer when requested to do so. So not doing something, so you're not actually doing something, and there's no commission here, you're choosing not to do something. Not doing something that the law requires you to do in this instance is an offence. So generally most of what the things that we're going to be talking about are about commission, about doing something that the law, law prohibits, whether that's stealing, whether that's hurting somebody, whether that's killing somebody. But some cases, in some instances, we'll be talking about omissions when we don't do something that we should be doing. Okay, so, and in that sense also, the this idea of a, a commission or omission um, includes the state of affairs and it includes the state of affairs or circumstances surrounding the commission of the crime so what were the circumstances and we'll look at the circumstances the state of affairs of theft when we get to that in a moment which is on the other side um, it can also be or it also includes the result or consequence Okay, and remember what we said, results or consequence means that at the end of the offence, what is it that has happened? What has been the result of that offence? In order for me to commit murder, for instance, the result has to be that somebody is dead. And that means that a key element of this is that I have to have caused that result. All right, and we'll look in great depth at that when we look at causation. Probably in two videos, it's so complex. But the notion is, is that in actus reus, certainly for result or consequence crimes, take, for instance, um, as I say, murder, it has to be proven that the defendant caused the result that occurred. And it's also absolutely imperative that the defendant acted voluntarily. And we're going to cover that now in a second. So if we think that there has to be a voluntary act, what do we mean by that? Well, generally, the accused conduct must be voluntary, a voluntary act or omission. They must actually want to do something. They must choose to do something. So, for instance, if I was to hold um, a weak person's uh, hand around a gun and pull their trigger, they wouldn't be doing a voluntary act in that case. Um, similarly so, they won't be liable for acts done in a state of automatism. What do we mean by that? Well, automatism is something that you have no control over. So I'll rule that out by putting a cross through it. 
Voluntary act is something that you choose to do. Automatism is something that you have no choice over. So, for instance, sneezing is an automatic um, reaction. And there's a very famous case that covers this concept of what is a voluntary act. And that case is Hill versus Baxter. Hill versus Baxter. Uh, oh, sorry, that's 1958. And in Hill versus Baxter, the judge talks about the now, what is now the infamous swarm of bees instance. And in Hill versus Baxter, the defendant was behind the wheel of his car when it collided with another. And at the trial, on a charge of dangerous driving, he claimed that he'd been overcome by an unknown illness and had been unconscious. Effectively, an involuntary act. And in his summing up, one of the things that the judge said, he, he brought forward this very famous, it was Lord Goddard brought forward a very famous and hypothetical instance of a swarm of bees, in which he said, an involuntary act would be if a swarm of bees was to fly into the car. Anything that you did with a swarm of bees in your car would be involuntary. One or two bees would be voluntary. You could control yourself. But if a swarm of bees flew in the car, it seems wholly sensible that you could not be responsible for your actions because you just would not be in control of them. And that would be involuntary. So Hill versus Baxter gives some notion of what we mean by the difference between a voluntary and an involuntary act. So we'll now move on to look at this concept of the accused must cause. And the key word here is cause the prohibited consequences. So the crime must be caused by some conduct. All right, and I said we're going to look at this in much greater depth when we look at causation. The conduct doesn't need to be the direct cause, okay, but it can be through the agency of others. So it doesn't need to be the direct cause, but it can be through the agency of others. And the conduct does not need to be the sole or the effective cause of the crime, providing it can be not sorry, providing it cannot be dismissed as trivial. All right, so I'll say that again. The conduct does not need to be the sole cause of the crime, providing it cannot be dismissed as trivial, or of course of merely events leading up to the commission of a crime. So I know that sounds complex, and it might not be completely clear until we look at the video on causation, but essentially when we have a result crime, what this really means in short is that defendant must cause the result. All right, now let's have a think about one of those instances in which I, I am not the sole or the effective cause. So if I, if I was to shoot somebody and on their way to hospital, the ambulance crashed and that person died en route to hospital, well, the cause of death would be the ambulance crashing and them dying um, in, in the ambulance en route to hospital. But what essentially what the law says is that my original shooting them is also a cause of their death. So that's what that means. But the key thing to remember at this stage is that the defendant must cause the result. Okay, so the defendant must carry out some conduct which causes the result of the end of the crime. Let's move on to omissions. And in terms of omissions, generally, there is no obligation in English law on anyone to prevent harm or wrongdoing. So what that means is that if I was to walk past a pond and I was to see somebody drowning in that pond, I have absolutely no legal obligation to go and rescue them. But there are some cases in which predominantly duty exists, in which me failing to do something would then give me liability. And we'll discuss omissions in the next video, actually, because it's a, a key part of our learning. But essentially, most of the things that we will do will be commissions. We will actually carry out an act. But on occasions where we can construct a duty, then failing to carry out that duty would result in, a, in, in us committing a crime. So do you remember what I said earlier? I could walk past somebody drowning and I wouldn't have to rescue them. Well, let's just imagine that I walk past the pond and it's my son drowning. Then because of the fact that I'm their parent, I have a duty to look after them. I then become liable. So failing to save them is an omission and I'd be liable for that omission. Right. Let's move on to this 
I'm going to test my Latin there. But there's a cardinal principle in terms of this relationship between actus reus and or in, in the relationship between the elements of criminal liability. And the cardinal princi principle is actus non facit reum, nisi men sit rea, which essentially means, if I've said that correctly, that um, conduct does not make a person legally guilty unless it is accompanied by a blameworthy state of mind. In short, the exact um, translation of this is that no act, no act is punishable. Punish, um, able, isn't it? No act is punishable unless it is performed with a criminal mind. So that's what that means. No act is punishable unless it is performed with a criminal mind. So we've talked about this concept of um, actus reus and all of the ways in which actus reus presents itself. If we remember up here, the fact that it has to be um, a state of affairs, results or consequence, it's got to be caused by the defendant and it has to be voluntary. All of that, even if it's present, is not punishable, there's no liability, unless the person has a criminal mind. Um, and we know full well from what we did in the last video that they were talking about mens rea. And we'll come back to mens rea when we look um, clearly, at, at, when we look at the um, mens rea in our video. So, where can we find the actus reus? Well, generally we find it, as we found out in the last, we find it either in um, the statutory definition or in the common law definition. So we find the actus reus contained within the definition, either laid out in statute or laid out in common law. So let's just take a quick look at an example. This is an example of theft. All right, this is the definition of theft as laid out in statutes, so it's a statutory definition from the Theft Act, Section 1 of the Theft Act. And it says that theft is committed. A person is guilty of theft if he dishonestly appropriates property belonging to the other with the intention of permanently depriving the other of it. So let's have a look. Firstly, let's look at the actus reus elements. Well, dishonestly involves the way in which somebody thinks. So this is a mens rea element. So if that will do, let's change the colour of our pen briefly. So dishonestly form the mens rea so we'll do that red is mens rea dishonestly mens rea and the next thing here look is the intention of permanently depriving the other person of it so there are two elements to the mens rea in theft there's dishonestly and the intention to permanently deprive so we go back to our green pen Let's have a look at the actus reus elements. So the first is appropriates. All right, so appropriates means to take, effectively. So all the ways in which somebody can take property is covered by the word appropriates. The next one is this concept of property. What is property? What makes up property? Those are the state of affairs, really. That's, that's part of the actus reus element. And the third actus reus element in the definition of theft is belonging to another. The property that you steal has to belong to somebody else. So as you can see from this definition, it clearly tells us where there are two elements of mens rea, and we'll look at mens rea in a subsequent video, but there are three elements of the actus reus. So our statute has provided us with a definition, and now we know where the actus reus elements are and where the mens rea ele elements are. Okay, so that sort of brings the introduction of actus reus to a close. What we're gonna look in the next video is we're gonna move on and look at omissions, those instances where here we commit or we complete the actus reus by not doing something that the law requires.